This is the Breachside Broadcast, the best Vox casting either side of the breach. Good day, Breachside. You're tuning in to Tales of Malifaux, and I am your announcer. We are opening up the show with a warning. Your friends at the Guild would like to remind you this is a time of year to wrap up warm. Many layers are advised. When we say wrap up warm, we do mean inside a heavily fortified building with heat and enough resources to last a number of days. When we say many layers, we are of course referring to layers of solid concrete or layers of heavy gunfire. You are being reminded because around this time of year, wave upon wave of rats and vermin burst up from the sewers to engulf our poor homes. So do be careful. Time to take your minds off those things with a story. This is Blind Man's Iron. Blind Man's Iron. Mr. Hey, mister! William Hiccup glanced down. A small boy stood at the foot of the porch, grubby and blonde-haired. Hiccup hadn't noticed him when he'd stepped out into the fresh morning and filled his lungs with the cleanliness of it. The boy was clutching a tree branch that had been hacked inexpertly into the shape of a firearm. An urchin, is it? he inquired. You got them guns made special, didn't you? the boy said, his large brown eyes on the supple calf leather holsters on Hiccup's thighs. These fine ladies, Hiccup asked, resting his tasseled gloves on the twin mother of pearl and chrome pistol butts. My Mary Beth and Marjorie Ellen? He knew that they were a pretty sight and caught the eye of men and boys alike. Compliments flowed like water around his ladies. The boy's eyes glowed. My brother Bart says you killed a hundred men. I bet it's twice that. Hiccup chuckled and took the opportunity to stand a touch more extravagantly. Is that so? He says you're so fast that you can't see your hands moving when you gun a feller down. Hiccup threw his head back for a boisterous laugh. Conscious of several bystanders on the street listening to the boy and admiring his finery. And why shouldn't they? When he had spent many a scrip on a monogrammed silk shirt, embroidered waistcoat and pants, with a crisp new navy pea coat and fawn-colored boots so shiny you could check your teeth in them. He cut a dashing figure and no mistake. It's true, I'm fast, he said in acknowledgement of the boy's comments. Can I see you draw, mister? I'd dearly like to see that. Draw my ladies, he said. My sweet beauties? Well, where's the harm in that? He took his time over it, of course. If something is worth doing, his pappy had said, it's worth doing right. The gloves were tugged tight. The belt settled over the hips. The brim of the hat set at a rakish angle. He wasted another moment smiling at the gathering crowd, especially that girl with the long, coal-black hair and the eyes like melted chocolate. And then he drew his pistols in a quick and supple motion, the way he'd practiced a thousand times before a mirror. The crowd murmured. His ladies were plated in the highest quality chrome and polish to a brilliant shine. Both were heavily customized Colt single-action army revolvers with enlarged nine-chamber drums delicately engraved with rose motifs and his initials. The front sights were removed to improve draw speed and to combat the additional drum weight. In the bright morning sun, they flashed like steel lightning. The urchin just stared, his jaw open. Forty caliber, he said to the boy. Very rare. Them's mighty fancy, the spectator piped. Hiccup spun one revolver and then the other. The light from them played across the goggling urchin's face. My lady's always draw an admiring crowd, he said. This was what he loved, the theatrics of danger. These common townsfolk saw his splendor and his wealth, and they feared him. And they were right to. You a lore man, a voice asked. No, he's one of them riverboat gamblers, said another. Dresses like a gent. Got money, I reckon. Hiccup preened in the adulation. He imagined his teeth were sparkling as much as his boots. He's no gambler, cut in a harsh female voice. That there's wild-eye hiccup. 
An uncomfortable silence followed, during which the crowd's admiration curdled into nervousness. More than a few began to shuffle away. Hiccup peered sharply through the dissolving bodies and spied a familiar face. Well, well, he said. Miss Calamity Chance. The raccoon hat and fur coat were as matted and bedraggled as ever, but her face had somehow become even more pointy and vinegary than he'd remembered. There was an elusive, handsome quality to her that was almost lost among the sharp planes of her cheeks, chin, and nose. But the effect was ultimately ruined by small and spite-filled eyes. The old fashioned those gaudy things, she asked, putting her hands on her hips. The action spread the wings of her fur coat and revealed a web of tatty leather strapping and holstered pistols. Hiccup counted seven without even trying. Still compensating with quantity over quality, he shot back. Her eyebrow arched at the long, polished barrels in his hands. Compensating? Funny you should choose that word specifically. He frowned in annoyance. Of all the people to show up in Low Craw the day after he rode into town, she was the last one he would have wished for. Miss Calamity Chance was known across every square inch of Malifaux as a bullet-slinging liability. She fancied herself as a gunfighter, but her reputation was not built on the men she'd killed, but rather the carnage she'd wrought on innocent persons and property. By all accounts an utterly appalling shot, she made up for this by blasting at her opponents with a near-endless succession of pistols secreted about her person. There was a persistent rumor that, to date, she'd inadvertently shot over thirty stray cats in her efforts to hit her intended targets. I like your coat, he scoffed. Cat skin, is it? Calamity glowered. How she loathed that man with his fancy European clothes and his shiny guns and his shiny boots. He swanked about the place like he was something special, but she knew the truth of it. Hiccup was a farm boy from Earthside who'd stumbled over a riderless horse and two saddlebags full of stolen gold bars. The dirty-handed youth had disappeared overnight and in his place appeared this ridiculous peacock who crossed the breach to create a name for himself. It was one cat, she said. Like I told you before, one cat. Rest that story is just plain hot air. Pretty much what's coming out of you now. Hiccup seemed unmoved. He gave his guns a last, ostentatious spin and slid them back into their holsters. Calamity would have dearly loved for him to drop one. Much of that stolen gold left, wild eye? She asked, watching him blanch slightly. She knew that it irritated him to have his dirty laundry aired in public, almost as much as it irritated him being called Wild Eye. My name is William, he stated. Wild Eye sit you better, I reckon, she sniffed. Yeah, them fancy pants ought to have set you back a few. Them shiny guns, too. Can't be all that much stolen gold left now with all the drinking and hotels and the gambling and what have you. It ain't like you can earn any more now, is it? I can charge more money per day than you earn in a year, woman, he said, his voice harsh with annoyance. I've lost count of the sheriffs and marshals I've assisted with my skills. That'd be about two, Calamity rolled her eyes, and here's me thinking you was an educated man. Hiccup stiffened his neck. The Lady Justice herself commented on my aim. Calamity snorted. I bet she did. She probably said, why the hell you shooting that way, you blind fool? We fighting them guys over there. Hiccup was a despicable coward and a fraud, and everyone realized it sooner or later. The man moved from town to town, using his image and fearsome aspect to impress the little folks. But sooner or later, his reputation always caught up with him. The stories that he'd killed fifty men were completely true, but only four of them had been opponents. The other forty-six were innocent bystanders who were cut down in Hiccup's frantic hail of gunfire. She'd heard about a tussle way down in Creaky Brook, where Hiccup had called out a cowpoke over a card game, then hid behind a barrel, firing his pistols over his shoulders and screaming. He shot six men and a woman that day. Meanwhile, the cowpoke escaped on Hiccup's stolen horse. Very amusing, I'm sure, he said. Who has commended you for your work, I wonder? That's for commending, he spat in the dirt. I let my guns do my talking for me. Hiccup smiled maliciously at the comment. Is that a fact, he thought to himself. He stepped down off the porch. Bruce passed a few remaining bystanders and walked to the fence across the street where he slipped a silver hip flask from his waistcoat pocket and stood it on one of the posts. There you are. Let's see your guns talk your way out of this. Calamity was looking at him with a touch of uncertainty. He could have laughed at the trap she'd talked herself into. 
That hip flask had cost him 30 scrip, but there was more chance of it being struck by lightning than by that shaggy-clothed harridan's aim. Go on, he goaded her. Let's see you put a bullet through my flask, if you think your linguistic skills are up to the challenge. She glowered at him, her sharp face creasing with anger and perhaps a shade of embarrassment to boot. She understood that there was no way for her to back out without losing face. That flask ain't gonna hold much liquor with a hole in it, she grunted. But there was no conviction behind it. A risk I'm willing to take, he sneered. Calamity glanced about her at the watchers in the street. There were more of them now that something interesting seemed to be going on. She set her jaw and drew a tarnished and rusty pistol. You're lost, wild eye. It's William, he corrected patiently. She raised the pistol and cocked it. Half closed one eye to sight down the length of the barrel. A handful of seconds passed, and then she lowered it again. Hold on there, she said. This is some sort of trick. You'll get me to put a hole in that thing, and then you go run to the sheriff saying I took a pop at you. In front of all these witnesses, he counted. Come, Miss Chance, you're stalling. She continued to glare at him, but made no effort to raise her pistol again. I don't trust you, she said. No more than I'd trust a rattler. Well then, let me sweeten the deal. He drew a big silver coin from his waistcoat pocket and spun it in the air. There's script for you, if you can make the shot. She watched the coin. But there was a corner of her mouth that had begun to curl up. So something had just occurred to her. Mighty keen to see someone else do the shooting, she said, loud enough for the spectators to hear. I'm thinking maybe you're awful eager to draw attention away from yourself. Stalling again, Chance? She shrugged, her insolent grin widening. Seems to me that a man carries smoke wagons like those, he ought to be able to use them. Hiccup didn't like the direction this conversation was taking. He tried to dismiss it. My skills are not in doubt here. No? The Harridan looked around the gathering. Anybody here ever saw a wild eye shoot off anything other in his mouth before? There were some blank expressions and a few shaken heads. Thought not, she continued. Well, why don't you show me how it's done, big man? Hiccup ground his teeth. There were an awful lot of people watching now, albeit from a respectful distance. If he took the shot and hit the flask, his triumph would be complete. But that was a big if. He wasn't under any illusion about his skills. He looked the part, that was for certain but he'd never been especially good at the actual shooting aspect of the gunfighter lifestyle. You want me to shoot my own flask, he asked. A bullet hole's a bullet hole, Hiccup, she said. Don't make much never mind whether it was my bullet or yours. Lesson, of course, you're saying you can't hit it. You must be joking, he snorted. I shot Bill Tranner through the eye at a thousand paces a year ago in Saltwood. This wasn't precisely true. He'd been 30 feet away and still missed Bill by a good 10 yards. He'd accidentally shot the town sheriff instead, who also had his gun trained on the outlaw, and it was the sheriff's surprised misfire that had hit Tranter in the eye. I heard that story too, Calamity Chance nodded, her pistol now hanging loosely at her thigh. Heard Bill Tranter was unarmed when he drew down on him. Heard the sheriff got killed that night too. The man was a savage, Hiccup said conscious of how defensive he sounded. He had killed the sheriff before I could fire. Must have been a born killer, taking out an armed man like that empty-handed. She grinned at Hiccup's reddening face. Funny thing, though. My cousin's husband, he's the undertaker over in Saltwood, says he picked a bullet out of Sheriff Cotton's chest, a forty caliber bullet, no less. Pretty rare. She shrugged as though it was a trivial thing. Who knows? Maybe old Bill just stabbed it right into the sheriff's chest, being such a savage and all. There were a few chuckles from the watching townsfolk, and Hiccup felt his hackles rise. A reminiscent is your game. Perhaps we should tell the good people about Cinder Hill, eh? He declared hotly, thrusting his thumbs in his gun belt and turning to address the interested faces. I wonder whether Miss Chance has ever seen fit to recount those tragic events. Chance swore under her breath. This was rapidly dissolving into a mudslinging contest, but at least the pompous fool seemed to have forgotten about his hip flask. Yes, as I recall, you'd gone up against the Clark brothers of Jamestown. Some sort of dispute over a dead cat, I believe. Calamity bared her teeth. 
Why would you know, Wild Eye? You wasn't even there. No, but the bartender at the Five Acres Saloon was. He said it was the strangest thing he ever saw. Calamity remembered his only too well. She crashed in through the door, hoping to take them by surprise. She already had a revolver in her left hand, but when she tried to draw the pistol tucked into her belt with her right, it snagged. She stumbled and fell through the door with one gun caught in her underwear and the other waving over her head. It went off as she hit the deck and shot a leg off a card table, toppling it and Jack Clark, who'd been leaning on it, to the floor. Big Tug Clark had started to laugh, and Lyle Clark went for his scattergun. She managed to rip the other pistol free, but her pantaloons came with it. Frilly pink things she had sent from Paris, hanging from the gun barrel like a flag. Lyle took aim with his scattergun, and she panicked. She fired on reflex and missed. The pink underthings shot through the air and hit Lyle full in the face. He toppled over backwards and knocked himself out on the hardwood floor. Big Tug laughed so hard he had a heart attack and dropped dead. I won that gunfight fair and square, she snapped, jabbing a thin finger at him. And all without hitting a single one of your opponents, Hiccup sneered. I wonder why you would have needed a gun at all. A bag of dirty laundry would have served just as well. Oh, yeah? Well, I heard you fight 18 rounds at Curly Rob Jackson at a distance of less than 50 yards, and nobody never seen no sign of any of them ever again, except for the one they found in Preacher Dobson's mule's ass, she shrieked, all pretense of civility gone. Not like the time you tried to bushwhack Rusty Cohen's gang, and the only thing you shot was the town hall. I heard a feller say the tower still rings 19 o'clock to this very day. The two of them were inches apart, screaming in each other's faces while the townsfolk stared, mouths open. Finally, Hiccup took a step back, trembling with indignation. There's only one way to settle this, he hissed. I demand satisfaction. Well, I'd be more than happy to shoot you dead if that's what you mean, she growled back at him. That'd be plenty satisfying, I reckon. Friday at dawn, he intoned, right here. Calamity spat ferociously and wiped her mouth. Works for me. Hiccup spun on his boot heels and stalked away, brimming with righteous anger and vim. He'd show that cat-slaying windbag who was the real gunman around here. He'd covered fifty yards before he realized what he'd done, and his guts dropped. Oh, hell, he thought. I'm for it this time. Now for a word from our valued sponsors. The Guild would like to request, and by request we do mean forcibly requisite your attendance, to a performance that the whole family will enjoy, because they have been forcibly advised to do so. The Rams Head Theatre is pleased to bring you Servitude, a life of service. Follow a man as he travels into a brave new world in search of meaning. Cheer as he works for his local Guild-operated factory. Marvel is in best hardy working conditions, and follow suit as he continues to do as he is told for the rest of his days. Servitude, a life of service. We'll see you there. No, really, we're expecting you. As you get yourselves ready for a mandatory dose of culture, open your ears for the next part of Blind Man's Iron. Calamity kept the fierce scowl on her face. But inside, her heart was rattling like a pea in a can. Facing down, Wild Eye Hiccup in a gunfight. In two days, she spun about and marched the other way before the audience could see how pale her face had become. With all the blustering and insult throwing, it was inevitable that Hiccup would have taken the hump. And now that his nose was out of joint, there was no way she could go back on her word, not with half the entire town having heard the exchange and the other half likely knowing by sundown. Going toe-to-toe with Hiccup would be a disaster. It was very likely that they'd kill each other in a blaze of gunfire, as well as most of the town in the process. That wouldn't do. She needed to come up with a plan, and she needed to do it quick. Calamity ran her tongue around her dry mouth. Actually, she needed a plan and a drink. Hiccup stalked purposefully along the main street, up the side alley and around behind the horse stables where he immediately dropped on his haunches and dry-heaved into the dirt. What have I done? 
he whispered to himself as soon as his roiling stomach quit its convulsions. What have I done? You gonna shoot that calamity lady then? chirped a near voice. Hiccup struggled to his feet, wiping at his mouth with one glove and trying to dust the seat of his pants with the other. The urchin had reappeared, the one with the wooden gun. He must have followed Hiccup from the guest house. I said I would, didn't I? He snapped in a pricklier manner than he'd intended. Bet you kill her dead before she even clears her holster, the boy boasted, yanking his knotwood sidearm from his pocket and jabbing at the air. Hiccup's stomach gurgled at the thought and he pulled a queasy face. Yes, I'm sure I will. This is going to be a great fight, the kid continued. I bet even old Bark Hooper will come and watch this one. Hiccup was reaching out to cuff the boy's ear and see him off, but he froze. Bark Hooper? The Bark Hooper? That's right, mister, the boy said proudly. Caleb, who works in the stables, overheard a teamster telling his daddy that he saw Hooper in Bronze Gulch a couple days back. Said he saw him in the saloon drinking and playing cards. Hiccup knew about the infamous gunfighter, but his stories were old. Nonsense, boy. Bar Cooper's dead. He was a legend when my daddy was a boy. The kid shook his head stubbornly. He saw him, he says. Large as life. Had that fancy revolver on him, too. Says he saw it with his own eyes. The blind man's iron, Hiccup said. He remembered those stories, too. A strange three-chambered pistol that Hooper had worn on his hip for nearly a century. The story went that Hooper scratched the name of his enemy onto a bullet, and when fired from that gun, it always hit its target. That would come in handy for Friday, I have to admit. If you ask him, he might let you borrow it, the boy said. Borrow it? I doubt it, Hiccup said. However, he wandered away. Forgetting about the kid as an idea began to take shape. If Hooper was still alive, he must be ancient. He suspected that the old man was unlikely to lend him the blind man's iron. But what if Hiccup was just to take it? Someone so old would be no match for a younger, quicker man. And he certainly wouldn't have time to scratch Hiccup's name onto a bullet. Not if Hiccup approached him as a friend. Chewing his lip and breaking into a grin, Hiccup began to pace in a circle. Yes, he thought. It could work. Calamity knocked back the shot and placed it on the bar for the fourth time. Her mouth was well lubricated now, but it was becoming evident that plans were not as easy to come by as liquor. No matter how much she drank, she was still going to have to face Hiccup in a real gunfight on Friday, unless she could think of something very quickly. Gunfight is coming out the woodwork around here, grunted the barman gently as he refilled her glass. How so? There's you and Hiccup here in town? We had Clancy Shaw come through here a week past with a bunch of convicts for the railroad, and now I hear old Bark Hooper's across the way in Bronze Gulch. Been there a couple of days, they say. Bark Hooper? Calamity lifted the glass and downed it. The same Bark Hooper that killed the Farrell twins and Pierre the Bull, and Two Barrel Pete, and Zhang Chi, and probably half of Texas if you listen to everything they say about him, nodded the barman, refilling her glass again. He's got to be dead, she said. My pappy used to tell me bedtime stories about him. Hooper's been in the dirt thirty years or more. The barman shrugged. I'd have agreed, but that's the rumor just the same. Calamity lifted her full shot glass, but this time she just held it, watching the cloudy amber liquid. If Bark Hooper was by some happenstance still kicking, he had to be positively decrepit by now. Likely a man of his notoriety had gotten by on reputation alone the last few decades. No one would have the sand to call him out because of that damned gun of his, the blind man's iron. The legend said he had to carve your name on a bullet before it would work. And just how fast a draw can you be when you're over a hundred years old anyway? She felt the germ of an idea taking root in the back of her mind. What if she could somehow get that gun away from him? Shouldn't be that hard. The old guy was probably as brittle as a clay pot, and a good shove down a flight of stairs would do the trick. She could collect the pistol, and then that peacock hiccup was as good as dead. Now what do you know, she thought to herself. His plans ain't so hard to come by after all. Ha ha! Homo 
Homo sapiens and their guns. Am I right, friends? My favourite character in that story is the street urchin. I find his boundless optimism delightfully refreshing and fleeting. Which of our dynamic <laughs> heroes will find the gun first? Who will win the shootout? Is the old man actually alive at all? So many questions. Find out for yourselves next time on Tales of Malifaux. Till next time, do stay safe out there, because after all, bad things happen.